Welcome to our study on the book of 1 Corinthians. This is session 35. You should have a note taker in front of you tonight, and we're going to be filling that in here in session 35. Now, you know from our previous sessions that we've been talking about the doctrine of our liberty in Christ. So let's go ahead and fill that out right up here on that note taker. That is the doctrine that we're going to be looking at. We'll be filling this note taker in as we proceed through the study. Look, I think that for a lot of folks, they're really unclear about everything that our liberty in Christ entails. And they're really just thinking about it, I think, from one way. I think most people do understand that when you have liberty to do something, it means you have the freedom to do it or you have the right to do it. And that is true. Uh, but and, and by now, because we've been in this for a couple of sessions, you also know that there is an appropriate time when we limit our liberty for the spiritual benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But when we think about liberty that way, most of the time we're thinking about liberty as it pertains to our personal lives. So I call that our personal liberty. Now, it's all personal in that when you see, we're going to talk about the three aspects of liberty. Two of those have to do with ministry. And I'm not talking about if you're a pastor or something like that. I'm just talking about in our lives. The other one has to do with what I call our personal liberty. You'll see what I mean as we start to go through this. But I'm making that separation, and I think you'll understand that as we, as we look at the verses. Now, when I, when I look at these three aspects of liberty, I see a positive aspect and a negative aspect. So let me just talk about those for a moment. The positive aspect is what we can do. The negative aspect is the fact that in a certain circumstance, we might, liber we might limit our liberty, and that would, be, that would be the negative aspect of that. All right, so having said that and kind of laid all of that out, as I said, most of the time we see liberty as the right to do something or God saying, it's okay with me if you do that. But this is mostly in relation to personal choices that we make. Does anybody remember what the circumstance was that we've been looking at here lately. There was a question that was sent to Paul. Remember what it was about? You know, we eat meat that's been offered to idols. Remember that? And so that I, I'm going to, I'm going to put that in the category of personal liberty. Uh, were they able to do that? And they were asking the apostle Paul about that. And so most of the time we, we see our liberty in areas like that. Um, I think we really need a fuller understanding of liberty, and we'll do that by straightening out a couple of misconceptions. Liberty, let me tell you what it is not. And, and, and I know that sometimes, the, the Bible does it this way. Sometimes when Paul is going to explain something to you, the first thing he does is, is tell you what it's not. And I found that that's going to be very helpful for us here. Liberty, our liberty in Christ is not a license to sin. Now, I think that goes without saying, but you would be amazed at the theological debate about that, that there is this idea that because Christ has paid for all of our sins on the cross, then we have liberty to do anything we want to do. Don't worry, it's all been covered, and, and there's nothing to worry about with regard to that. But the Apostle Paul will not agree with that theology. Yes, all of our sins have been forgiven. How many? Everyone. How about the ones you haven't committed yet? Yeah, they've all been paid for. In fact, they were all paid for before we ever committed one of them, right? 2,000 years ago, the payment was made on the cross. We appropriated that upon our faith in Christ and his finished work on the cross. And so all of the sins that we would commit would come under the blood. But liberty is not, hey, I can just do whatever comes into my mind because everything is paid for. And so we kind of get a a get out of jail free card. That's not that's not how that happens. However, and and remember, we're not under the law. We're under grace. I want to make that clear because that's going to be the context for what we're looking at here. And even under grace, we have been given clear commands to stay away from sin. Now, the question is why? Here comes the theology again. Look, 
back in Romans chapter 6, we were given the details about how we are to overcome sin on a daily basis. I'm not going to take us back to Romans 6 and reteach all of that, but Paul did explain that we're dead to sin and alive unto God. It's part of our identity in Christ, and we're supposed to live out of that identity. So when Paul says, flee fornication, there's a reason for that. When he talks about don't worship idols, there's a reason for that. And while we're on the subject, let me just make sure and straighten this out, because I don't want there to be any misunderstanding about this. If you commit sin, you do not lose your salvation. Now, someone is now going to come along and say, yeah, but if you're living in sin, then you, you will not lose your salvation. You need to understand there is not a sin on the planet that Christians don't commit. That is just the fact of it. I'm sorry about that, and I wish it wasn't that way, but it is true. Here's the number two thing I want you to understand. You will not lose your fellowship if you sin. Now, that was the way I was reared up. When I went to church as a boy and all through, even, even through my schooling, everybody pointed me at 1 John 1, 9 and said, no, you won't lose your salvation, but you'll lose your fellowship with God. So in order to be in right standing with God, you need to do what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, so we need to, and as soon as you do that, then you're back in right fellowship with God again. So you need to, need to clear those things out. You need to be you know, quick about it you know, and make sure that you just stay up with it. Don't let things get away from you. But here's the truth of what your Bible teaches you. You do not lose your fellowship with God. You know why you don't lose your salvation? Because your salvation is not dependent upon your righteousness. It is dependent upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So it is sure and secure, and you can't lose it by your sinful actions because you couldn't gain it by your unsinful actions. Now let's talk about fellowship. Your fellowship is vested in Jesus Christ. So when you got placed into Christ, everything about your relationship with God is now through you being in his son. The only way for you to lose your fellowship with the father is for him to lose fellowship with his son. That is never going to happen. So your fellowship, now, some, now someone is going to hear me say this, they're going to swing the pendulum the other way here, but I just want you to be clear. Your salvation is not in your works and your fellowship is not vested in your works. All of that got done in Christ so that God could give you a position in Christ in which you have been made righteous. And I mean, really it's his righteousness. When we were praying earlier, and I was talking about some of those things, and I know I listed a bunch of them, but look, I, I get tired sometimes of saying, Lord, we just thank you for all the things that you did, and we just never mentioned any of them. But you know what? One that's very pertinent to this study is the fact that we were in, we had the righteousness of his son imputed to our account, and positionally before God, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And that is a truth that, and by the way, that's a real change. You don't look differently. If you've ever seen somebody before they get saved and after they get saved to take a picture, they just look the same. But what changed is something on the inside. The old man in Adam got put to death, and now you're a new creature in Christ, and you really are. Okay, now I'm not going to get into all of that, but here's the next thing. And God is not punishing us if we sin through the physical circumstances of our lives. That is, that is something that is very tempting to do, but you're acting like you are back under the law. What are we told twice in a row over there in Romans chapter 6? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Two verses later, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
And what do we do? We read that and we say, thank God I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. And then we think God is dealing with us as though we're under the law. What was the law? It was a performance contract. And if you did bad, what happened? You got punished. And if you got, if you did good, what? You got blessings, right? And that's the way everybody thinks it's going today. You are not under the law. Grace is not about keeping the law. Grace, is that a free gift? So let me, can you earn a gift? No, it has nothing to do with it. The gift is given on the part of the giver, right? Not the merit of the receiver. So when we talk about grace, God is not punishing you and rewarding you based on how good or bad you have been that week. It's not God's version of Santa's naughty and nice list. This is something very different. Now, having said all of that, the things that may happen in our lives are not individualized, personalized, targeted punishments from our Heavenly Father. Why? Because those sins have already been forgiven. And so don't think, however, don't think that, oh, and see, that's kind of what gives rise to, oh, I can do whatever I want. I have liberty. I my position with God is not hindered. My fellowship with God is not hindered. And I can just do whatever I want. Don't think there's not a consequence for sin because there is. And I want to talk about that one just for a moment. Now, for the folks sitting in this room, you may go, this is old hat. I'm going to take a nap for five minutes while you do this. But listen, to some folks that are listening to this on a recording, this is brand new information. So we need to say it right. If you if you engage in sinful behavior, if you leave that unchecked, it will it will establish in your soul. And I don't know how to do this, but let's just let's just do it like let's just do it like this. Okay. This is your soul. Okay. We'll just do it kind of like that. I don't know how to do it except you know your soul looks like a checkerboard, right? Uh, I have not. All right. And then right up here, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get a stronghold built up in your soul. Now, I know, I don't know if that's what a stronghold looks like, but that's how I drew it. Bob Summers, eat your heart out. Okay. So, you get, if, you, if you continue in sin, a stronghold will get built up in your soul. What is a stronghold? Well, Satan is the one that's building it, that is for sure. And what he's doing is he is, is establishing something in your soul for you to live out of that is actually contrary to some truth in the scripture. And he wants you to live out of that. And here's what's going to happen. When you do that, there are tormentors, I'm using the word the Bible uses here, that will actually afflict the people who are doing this. So you know what happens over here? So here's what you do. All of a sudden you get this guilt and over here, you get shame. And then over here, guess what? You'll get anxiety. And then over here, you'll get anger. And, uh, and, and it, I mean, I could go on and we could fill up every square, but that's what Satan is doing is he gets, you know what? He promises, oh, if you do this, you'll love it because sin is so attractive. What he's doing is working to establish a foothold in your soul. And from there, he is going to branch out and he's going to af afflict every area of your life. Will you lose your salvation? No. Will you lose your fellowship with God? No. But you know what you will do? You may, you may uh, annihilate your spiritual life if you allow that to go on unchecked. It will stop your growth in Christ it will cause your desire to be godly, to begin to lessen. And then you'll begin to look for solutions to these problems that are going on in your life. I was, you know, so here's this one. So you know what? I, I'm all depressed. Nobody wants to connect that back with something that Satan has already established in their soul. He's operating behind the scenes. You don't see it. And so uh, this, is, this is what's going on with me. Okay. But that, and this is what sonship transformation 
was all about handling, right? And by the way, that has really been great. Tell me, Tracy, the gal that said 10, how, where was she? She's uh, in Michigan. There's a, okay, there's a lady in Michigan called Tracy. Can we get 10 of those Sonship Transformation books? Because we had a bunch of folks who want to go through that. Somebody else called and said, can you send us five? Where was that? In Mississippi. That's right. So, and so we, <laughs> we and, and it's amazing how when people discover that, all of a sudden, it's like this missing piece of the puzzle that they haven't seen. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm really glad for all of that. So strongholds will produce those effects that we're putting up there. And the point here is even though our sins are forgiven, don't get to thinking that there is going to be no consequence for that because they'll have very real consequences that will impact us spiritually and may even ruin our lives. May I just say to you that when someone finally gets the end of their rope here, you know what they'll start thinking? The world would be better off without me. And those things happen every hour of every day, and they never are able to trace that back to where that came from. And I'm telling you, that's the issue right there. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for us to just seriously look at these admonitions to stay away from sin. They're not trying to put you under the law, but what they are trying to do is salvage you from becoming shipwreck in our faith. And so that is the important thing to understand about that. Now, it is true that by our liberty, we can enjoy some things that are on this earth. But I would like for us to begin thinking about liberty now as our opportunity to make wise and godly sonship decisions. Think about your liberty as the opportunity to do that. Um, so we are free to make wonderful decisions about all of the things that God does not consider to be sinful. I'm going to give you some examples of that. And for what purpose? Well, one of those purposes is so that we would enjoy our lives. I mean, that is that, that there is truth to that, but there is more to that. So now that we've looked at what liberty is not, I want to talk about what our liberty is, and I'm going to give us a three-part definition. So here's what it does. The first thing it does and I'm going to abbreviate it because I'm putting on the whiteboard, but you should fill this in on your note taker. This it, it's not already filled in on your note taker, is it? Okay. All right. So I, I know I wrote it here, but it's too long. I, I wrote, okay, let's just do it. It allows us to minister the gospel to the lost. So there's the first one. Your liberty is given to you so that you can minister the gospel to the lost. And I want us to talk, we'll talk about these one at a time. Paul is going to use himself as this example right here in this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want you to look at this chapter with me. So let me put these verses up on the PowerPoint so that we can see them together. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Now, I'm not going to do the whole exegesis on this right here. We'll get down to verse 19 shortly, and then we'll look at it. But for now, I just want you to notice that in line with this first definition, or this first aspect of liberty, Paul says this, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do, for the gospel's sake. Do you see what he's saying here? This I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, as Paul talks about this, you understand. Now, look, there's a whole lot we could talk about this, but what I'm trying to do is focus on the doctrine that is at hand. When Paul says he has made all things to all men that he might save some, 
He is able to do that because he has been, along with us, given the liberty to do that. Isn't it great that people don't have to come to the church, sit down in the seat, only then can they hear the gospel and be saved? But Paul has liberty now to carry the gospel to a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. This is one of those positive aspects that we were talking about this. Now, we're going to look at this passage in more detail a little later on. But here's what, I, I mean, you would agree. Paul is talking about a lot of different people in a lot of different circumstances and even different cultures, giving them the gospel in a way that he can relate that to them. And that's what he is doing there. Now, I realize that our liberty, uh, so I want us to realize that our liberty has an application to the lost, and, and there's all kinds of ways to example that. So I'm going to go back in my own life and give you an example of when I was co-pastor of a church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So when, when I was there, what I did is I took some of the kids, I was the youth director, and I took some of the kids in our junior high department, some of the kids in our high school. I got a few folks from the college and career department. Did they even call it that anymore? I don't know. I lose those terms. Junior high. That's probably not right, is it? Anyway, and then I got a few adults, and I got them all. You know, we got it all together. We took a bus. One of the We had a bus ministry, so we ran church bus routes. We painted one of those buses with bright colors, and we put a, a big title across it. It said, Gospel Movie Bus. And it had all this bright colored. We blacked out all the windows behind the driver's seat. We put a curtain up. We took out the first two rows of those seats. And then what we did is we drove into an area where there was an apartment complex. And while a few of us set up the movie bus and the snow cone machine, the rest of us went door to door, finding people that were out knocking on apartment doors, and given out these little flyers that said at one o'clock, there's going to be free movies and free snow cones for everybody that comes and watches the movie. And we're going to run that movie every 30 minutes. And we're going to do this either till nobody shows up or it's four o'clock. And then we're going to stop. And we go hand out those flyers everywhere. Kids would go running to, you know, take it home and all of that kind of business. And you know what we did? We set up this little movie for kids and so you'd come into the movie bus, you'd find a seat, we'd pull that curtain, the windows are blacked out, we'd pull that curtain, we had a generator and we'd turn on that, that projector and we'd start showing that movie and everybody would watch that movie. At the end, anybody that wanted to trust Christ as their savior, we had several counselors in there where we'd be talking to them about trusting Christ and then everybody got a ticket for a free snow cone. And then they'd head out the door. They'd go line up at the snow cone machine, and the next movie bunch would pile in. We literally gave the gospel to thousands of adults and children in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana, trying to get the gospel out. Now, you know what? If we were waiting on those folks to show up at our church, how many of them would have ever heard that? Most of them. Most of them. And so here's what I'm saying. Even though I didn't think about it that way, we had the liberty to do that. And so we did all kinds of inventive things. We did a, a Saturday movie night where we would go into the apartment complexes and show a movie on the side of one of the apartment buildings. We had speakers putting the sound out, and we gave out bags of popcorn. Whole families would come out and sit out there on blankets on the ground and watch the movie and eat popcorn. And guess what we're doing at the end? The end of that movie is talking about trusting Christ. We're right back where we were. I mean, we did some other things too. I remember we did street preaching late at night in downtown Baton Rouge in front of a very difficult district. Not important for me to describe the details, but it usually ended with the police and dogs. And here's the terrible thing about that. The dogs don't know you're the preacher. <laughs> they just know you're not the police. And they bite everybody. <laughs> and I can remember those were very adrenaline-filled nights. 
So we did, a, and and by and we didn't take our junior high kids to that. We took the little kids. Uh, no, we we didn't take we didn't we didn't take them. Well, we did these kinds of things because that was you know what. And I mean, I look back on that, and we were just trying to find ways to get the gospel out there. But the real thing is, we're trying to become all, we're trying to walk in the shoes of the people that we're trying to get the gospel to, and as best that we could, we're trying to become all things to all men, so that we could by some means save some. That's the liberty. That, that's the positive end of the liberty. Let me give you the negative end real quick. Do I have liberty to share the gospel with anybody that will listen wherever I am? Yes. But you know what? I want a little wisdom with that liberty. And sometimes I limit my liberty because I may be in a grocery store checkout line and I may be thinking I would really like to witness to this gal that's ringing everybody up. But there's a line behind me and she's being paid to do a job. And I realized that if I stop that line to try to give her the gospel, she's going to be very uncomfortable because she's been paid to do a job, not listen to me preach. And the folks behind me are not happy because they're waiting to get out with their groceries. So you know what I always do? I don't use that as the opportunity to do that. Now, can I hand out, you know what? I gave away my card tonight to somebody that I met here in Glenrose. So I had it in my pocket and I was gonna, you know those little cards we did with the QR codes on them? All right, so you know what? You What you can do is you can just slide that over and say, hey, take a look at that when you get a chance and just leave it at that. That doesn't take but that long and it doesn't interrupt anything. But you know what? You have to make a wise decision about when to limit that liberty and when to pursue that liberty. All right, now, there, I know right now there are people that are listening that are, you have a question in your mind, and I want to answer that question. Because all of us have been there. We have had an opportunity. We're in the presence of someone. We're not sure if they're saved, but we would like for them to hear the gospel. But for one reason or another, we were reluctant to give them the gospel. And then we feel badly about it because we felt like that was a really good opportunity, and I didn't take advantage of that Maybe you were a little bit fearful in that particular circumstance. Um, and all of us have been there, times when we wish we had said something when we didn't. So let me tell you a way around that. If you don't feel confident enough giving the gospel to someone and talking them through it, there's a couple of things you can do. The first one is go back to our Dropbox and look at the School of Evangelism and refresh yourself on how to make that gospel presentation. We did that. I, 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 we even, um, what, what's the word? We acted it out so people could see how to do that. It's very straightforward. But here's the other thing you can do. You can take one of those cards, <laughs> keep reaching for it. You can take one of those cards and you can, oh, thank you, Renee. Okay, so you take those cards and what you can do is, Write a note. What did you say? Yeah, take a look at that when you have a chance. That's exactly right. Millennium, but now I've heard of that guy. I'm not, no, I'm not doing that. All right. So what you can do is you can write a note in a card and just say, there's something very important that I wish I could talk to you about. Can you please scan the QR code on the back of this card with your phone or any device? And it will take you to a very short video presentation that will tell you something very important. And just say it that way. And you can, you can just mail it and send it to them or drop it off to them or hand them the card, whatever. And then they can watch that presentation of the gospel. And so don't let Satan, once again, try to get the upper hand because you missed an opportunity. Sometimes, look, if you're making that decision out of wisdom, then just let that be that. You made a sonship decision. That's fine. If you felt like, I know I should have did it, I, I just didn't do it, then just give them the card and let them do that, and it'll be fine. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, okay, let me catch up to where I am in the notes here. I, I do understand, by the way, when Paul writes this, he's not talking about starting a gospel movie bus. I understand that. But I think the principle is the same. So just like Paul said, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the weak, I became as weak. He's just trying to 
find some kind of a footing to be able to give folks the gospel. And it's his liberty in Christ that allows him to do that. Okay, now um, here's the next one. And let me give you this one. And that is, it allows us to minister to the saints. And when we're talking about ministering to the saints, you know, we're talking about being at, now these are folks that are already saved. So I'm going to give you a verse that's going to go along with this. So look, where, where is this found? Well, we're already talking about this. So this is going to be 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. That's where we are in this study. So those are the three chapters that talk about your liberty in Christ. So when you're talking about the doctrine of your liberty in Christ, you already know there's a three-chapter set over here that's all dedicated to your liberty in Christ. But let me give you another one to put that with that. That's going to be Galatians 5 in verse 13. In Galatians 5 and in verse 13, Paul is going to now give us something else about liberty. He's going to do it over there with the Galatians. He says, for brethren, ye have been called. I've got it on the PowerPoint. What am I doing? For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love do what? Serve one another. So guess what? Our liberty allows us to minister the gospel, the gospel to the lost in all kinds of creative ways. And it also allows us to minister to our fellow saints, to love them. And in what ways would we possibly minister to our fellow saints? Okay, you could encourage it. Look, uh, Lily saying, you know, you could talk to them about the Lord. You know, we just went up and did Pam Lejeune's uh, memorial service, okay? And uh, would it be appropriate to encourage the members of that family? Sure, absolutely. But do people have to have gone through a big loss to be for us to be able to love them or demonstrate our love for them? No. Oh, to be there for them. I mean, that's that that's sometimes a really big thing just for them to know that you're there. But look, here's what I'm asking us to do. I'm asking us to think about using this liberty to be able to minister in ways to our fellow saints. Now, I'm going to give you one example, but this happens to me all the time, all the time. I am so, uh, I, I, you know what? I, I mean, I, it, it's so fortunate that folks understand the doctrine and they live out of that doctrine and I become the beneficiary of that. But last Tuesday, when I left here, you know, from here, when I drive out of Glen Rose, it's about an hour and a half to the interstate. And I really don't have hardly any phone signal at all till I get right back up close to the interstate. Larry and Sheridan Daniels called me at 1130 last, that, and two weeks ago when I was on my way back and I was not quite to the interstate. And I and it was the call, I'd get them and it would drop it. And finally I said, let me call you back as soon as I get to the interstate. Finally, they understand it. I called them back when I got on the interstate and here's what they said. That lesson tonight was so good. And then you know what they said? Here's what we learned. And they told me what they got out of it. And they said, that was marvelous. We, I, I see y'all are not making notes to call me tonight. What, what is wrong with y'all? Look, they did, and you know what? That so encouraged me. I thought about that all the way home. Now, look, that kind of stuff happens. And I, it just calls out, if you're listening on Zoom, I can call your name. Don't, I know you're not upset, but you know what? Folks send me cards. And you know what I do? I paste them to the front of my refrigerator and they stay up for a month. When you were there, did you see the cards on my refrigerator? Yeah. In fact, did you read the cards on my refrigerator? You did. Okay. All right. Well, they're in public display. So, okay. And you know, let, let me tell you, I, I, am, I, I love that because that is so encouraging to me. And the folks that are living out of there, they're finding what, you know what they're, they're finding to do? 
They're, they may not realize it, and I'm hoping they will by this lesson, but they are using their liberty to minister to their fellow saints. And so you don't just do that with me, you do that with each other, right? So that we're constantly encouraging one another and building up each other and edifying one another and all of those kinds of things. And so I just wanted to give you an example of that. Okay, and now I want to give you this last one, and that is it allows us to enjoy life on this earth. Your liberty allows you to enjoy life on this earth. I'm going to give you an example about that as well. Um, when, uh, when my kids were little, um, there was a lot of things that we did, but I remember one in particular. We went to Florida, and we went to Disney World. It was right when Epcot Center had first opened up. I don't know what you're thinking. Gosh, that was back in the 20s. How long ago? But, I mean, it was back there a while. And so we went to, we did, we went to Disney World and we went to Epcot Center and we did, and then we went to SeaWorld. And so, you know what? We rode the rides and we watched the shows and we did all that. Let me ask you, was there anything very spiritual about all that? Not really. And did God tell me to do that? No, that's just what we decided to do. But was it fun? Yeah. I mean, was it good for us to do those things together? Sure. I mean, did it kind of, bond the family, you know, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, except for when Phil threw away his $6 ice cream cone and pretended he ate it. Okay, sorry, that's, a, that's sorry. But you know, yeah, it was a great experience. Did we have the liberty to do that? And see, here's the thing. Sometimes people would look at that and they go like, oh, I can't believe you're going over and done. You got to understand, you have liberty in Christ. And you can make a decision to do that. Now, someone says, oh, that stuff, that's not, that's not my cup of tea at all. All right, so I'll just take you to one more. When I was a kid, my mom and dad, they, we bought a ski boat. And we used to go to Lake of the Pines. And as soon as they got off on Friday, we would all head out. Anybody know where Lake of the Pines is up in East Texas? A few have saved people in here. Okay. So we, we'd go up to Lake of the Pines and we'd throw up the tent and get out the cooking stuff and you know all of that and the sun would be going down sometimes we'd ski on friday night if we got there enough time that we could get out there and i love doing that but an all day saturday we'd be skiing out there on the lake and you say well that doesn't sound very godly well it wasn't it's just what we did as a family but it, but it sure but you know what it was sure fun for us kids and we loved that it gave me memories of things that we did together and it may not have been, you know, God telling us you need to go to Lake of the Pines, but you know what? Here's the thing. But our fo my folks always kept that in line. You know what we did? We always left Saturday night because Sunday morning, you know where we were. You know my story. We're at church. And you know what? We may be out there camping, but we still read the Bible together at night before we went to bed, and we still prayed together as a family. Those are the kinds of things that really I feel like kind of help bond us together. Did we have the liberty to do that? Sure we did. I would tell you stories about Tannen and Olivia when they came out to the house. However, it's on the tape and I'm gonna save it for a juicier time. But I have them on video at the Sand Hills State Park. You can use your imagination. Was it okay for them to do that? Was it okay for them to get down and roll down those steep sand dunes to the bottom? Yes. And was it okay when, 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 when Tanning was almost at the top for Olivia to climb over the top of him and get up to the top first? The answer is yes. You know why? Because she has liberty to do that. Now, look, all I'm saying is, and this is all this lesson was about. And so here we are, we're perfect. We're right on time. What is our liberty? I, I see two ministry applications. It allows us to minister the gospel to the lost, and it allows us to uh, m minister to the saints. And then it allows us to enjoy our lives here not to the detriment of our spiritual life, 
but as something else that we do. Does so everybody see that? See, the reason I want to say this is because these are the two that people don't normally affiliate with liberty. We think of liberty as, okay, I can eat meat offered to idols. Okay, I can do this. Okay, but it's all kind of in the personal realm. I want you to see that the real purpose of ministry is so that we, by love, serve one another. Make one last statement about this. Boy, this is really important. I'm going to expand on this in the weeks to come. Those kinds of exhortations are not meant to let me decide what I'm going to do. And oh, yeah, by the way, I need to do this out of love. The love needs to already be in place. And what we do needs to come out of that. Does that make sense? So that that's not the afterthought. It's not like, okay, well, if I do that, because... <laughs> I'm going to talk about this a little later, but I can remember a guy saying, he'd quote that verse and he would go, there are folks in this room that know what I'm talking about, so it's not important for me to say it. Do you used to say, well, the Bible says, you know, to tell the truth, and the truth is, and then he would tell you all your faults. And then because he knew the rest of the verse, he would say, but I'm telling you that in love, but he wasn't. He was saying that because he wanted to make sure you knew what irritated him. And so I'm just going to say, that's why Romans, those first five core features of godly love are taught to us back there in Romans chapter 12 and 13. First part of 13. Those five core features of godly love are instilled in us back there so that by the time we get to the place where we're talking about exercising our liberty in Christ, it will be out of that. Not, let me just do what I want to do and then I'll just try to love you while I'm doing it. Do you realize how backwards that is? Okay. Yes. Jews didn't have any liberty under the law. That's correct. Absolutely right. Their, their, every day of their life was, was covered. That, let me say that on my mic so that everybody will understand what Rick is saying, because he's absolutely right. Oh, they did. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to say it again anyway. <laughs> the Jews under the law did not have liberty. Everything was prescribed for them. I mean, even the kind of... Um, fabrics you could put together in a garment. Do you need to go to the Old Testament and look and see what, what fabrics can be put together in a garment so that when you're at the store, you can check the tag and see if it's a godly garment? Not in the dispensation of grace. Huh? If, see if it's kosher, right? Right. Those shirts usually don't taste very good anyway. But you, you, you see the liberty that we have in Christ, and it's a wonderful thing. But remember what Paul says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And so that's what I've hoped to do in this first lesson is to establish that our liberty is to enable us to give the gospel to the law, to enable us to uh, minister to each other and encourage one another and edify one another and then to enjoy our life. And when I was first writing these notes, I wanted to say, and I don't think I was right, so I didn't put it in your, I changed it out of your notes, but I was saying these first two are the really the important ones. I don't think this one is nearly as important, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, and I'm not trying to say going to Disney World is as important to God as somebody hearing the gospel, but I am saying this, that to God, it's all important. And there's an appropriateness to all of it. God's not going, well, okay, I guess you can enjoy yourself like he's upset about it. He actually made this life so that you could. And so there are simple things that you can do and utilize your liberty that cause you to really, instead of going around like you've been slapped with a persimmon, you know what? You can smile a little bit and love folks and really live this life because guess what? Your Heavenly Father that created all this and put all this here, right? Okay, let's, uh, that's the end of session 35. So we'll take a break here and then we'll